I'm hoping that this is the very first hamster to ever, ever participate in a TED event. Uh, when we arrived at the gates today, we discovered my little girl had brought the hamster in the back of the car. We got to the security, no animals allowed. So my husband said, oh, but the hamster's part of the talk. So the hamster's part of the talk. Be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. The water that we drink and use today is the same water that contained the first signs of life on this earth. It's the same water that rained on the dinosaurs, and it's the same water that was drunk by both Adam and Eve and Henry VIII. There's no more water around now than there was then. And all this water moves perpetually around in the water cycle, raining down on the earth, being collected in the rivers, running down to the sea, and all the while evaporating upwards to the clouds to once again form the rain. But what if some of this water gets lost? What if it's some of it, little by little, no longer participates in the cycle? What if some of it becomes so contaminated it can no longer be purified by the water cycle? What if some of it becomes so salty it can no longer evaporate, like the Dead Sea? And what if some of these replenished water supplies are poisoned at their source? Well, this is what's happening in the water cycle today. But imagine, imagine if we could deconstruct these contaminated waters and form pure water, pure usable water that we could re put back into the water cycle, as well as take the contaminants and recover them in the form of some, something useful, like pure salts. So, for example, I've got here, can I get the video? An example of some of the ways we could recover these, let's see if this works, Potassium chloride, which is worth 2,000 rand a ton. Copper sulfate, which is worth uh, 4,000 rand a ton. Potassium permanganate, 14,000 rand a ton. Nickel sulfate, 21,000 rand a ton. Cobalt sulfate, 63,000 rand a ton. So these are all the contaminants that could potentially be recovered. Not very good. Hey, anyway, if I mix them all together... They're now worth nothing, and I have to pay you to take them away. Can I have the slide back again? So this concept of deconstructing contaminated water into useful products is what we've been doing in our lab. Basically, we're using a process called eutectic freeze crystallization, which involves cooling the contaminated solution down to the freezing point. So the water crystallizes out as ice, and the contaminants crystallize out as pure, usable salts. So this, this process uses the mighty forces of nature, natural forces that form icebergs, natural forces of gravity, and natural forces that form pure crystals. So in this process, nature determines that ice is less dense than water, and therefore ice, like an iceberg, floats, and the salt, which is more dense than water, sinks. So we can separate the water in the form of ice from the salts. Nature also determines that crystals, when they grow, grow in a very ordered, structured way, in a crystal lattice. Alien molecules don't fit very well, and so the crystal prefers the molecules that fit to those that don't. They cause less disruption. And so this process intrinsically grows pure crystals. So this is what we've been doing in our lab taken, for example, here's an example of one and a half liters of contaminated water. This is the real deal. And out of this one and a half liters, we recovered a liter of pure water, which I'm happy to drink, and a remaining impure solution, as well as 100 grams of pure sodium sulfate salt. Now, this sodium sulfate salt is not very valuable. It's worth about 2,000 rands a ton. But we import eight tons a year. So this doesn't make sense to me. We import the salt. We use it in the process. We then pay to throw it away on a waste dump only to import another eight tons. 
So I imagine that you're thinking, that all sounds very simple. Just take the water, cool it down, freeze it, ice floats, salt sinks. So what? So I'd like to just give you a little bit of insight into a number of the challenges. The first challenge is, on the one hand, if you freeze the solution really fast, you make something like an ice slash puppy like what you buy at the movies. On the other hand, to make a really large ice crystal, like an iceberg, takes thousands of years. So the engineering question is, how fast can we freeze that solution and still get away with being able to separate the ice from the contaminated solution? The scientific question, of course, is, how does it really work? What are the mechanisms of the crystal growth? And how can we develop the data to provide information to make good engineering decisions? The second challenge is to grow crystals that really are pure. Now remember, we're growing crystals from that highly contaminated solution that I showed you. And I'd like to talk just briefly about what happened in one of the aspects of this project. We found that, and this is, an, this is the sodium sulfate crystal that you saw in that bottle, when we grew the sodium sulfate crystal from a, from a synthetic solution, it was indeed pure. But when we grew it from the real solution, it was contaminated with selenium, highly impure, in fact. So the question, the research question for us was, what is the source of the contamination? Now, there are only three options. One is that the contamination is the solution that's now sticking to the outside of the crystal. The second is that a bubble of the solution has somehow become trapped in the growing crystal. And the third is that somehow the selenium has disguised itself as a crystal molecule and inserted itself into that crystal lattice. So option one, the film, if you wash the crystal, it should come off. We did that and we still found it was contaminated. Number two, the bubble of solution in the crystal. Well then, if you measure the concentration in the crystal, it must be the same as the solution outside, and it wasn't. In fact, it was much more concentrated in the crystal than out. So that leaves only the third option, that the selenium has actually inserted itself into the crystal lattice. And if you look here at the selenate molecule, which is the green, and the sulfate on the right, you'll see that in fact the selenate is very, very similar to the sulfate molecule. And therefore it has the ability to insert itself into the crystal lattice without very much disruption. The third and last challenge I'd like to talk about is the question, isn't this very expensive, this whole idea of freezing water? And in fact, most people, when I present this process, that's the first question that gets asked. And my answer to that is, yes, it is expensive, but it's much cheaper and more sustainable than any other alternative around at the moment. The major competitor would be evaporative crystallization. If you take a liter of water and boil it to make steam, it'll cost you one rand 20. If you freeze it, it'll cost you 20 cents. So it's significantly cheaper than evaporation. Therefore, the carbon footprint is significantly less, and this is to scale. The eutectic freeze crystallization is 13% of the carbon footprint of evaporative crystallization. And the other advantage is that you create pure salts out of eutectic freeze crystallization. Whereas in evaporative crystallization, because all the water is going off as steam, the salts all end up together in a mush at the bottom of the crystallizer, plus all the toxic components, and you have to dispose of them in a waste dump, sometimes even a hazardous waste dump. So what excites me about this work? What is my idea worth sharing? Well, I have to go back to the title of my talk, which is also my motto, be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. And my experience of being bold is in my family, my grandmother, uh, Nellie Downs, was a pilot, adventurer, a specialist anaesthetist at the time when women were not very common in the professional world. Um, she was very bold, and she insisted that the only possible career for me was medicine. So, of course, I decided categorically I would have to do something else. Then my mom, Lilith Seals, who seemed to find her boldness a bit later on in life, um, when she started off as a, a maths and science teacher at a girls' high school, and when she was 36, she found her boldness, and she went off and took her first flying lesson in secret 
um, at Virginia North Airport. And she then went on to apply for a job as an airline simulator instructor, and the advert said, male applicants only, and she got the job. And then sometime after that, she ended up flying 747, so this is her in front of one of her airplanes, for um, Luxavia, Air Mauritius, and Air Namibia. My brother, Ian Billing, I think he's actually cornered the market on boldness. I don't really have a lot to say, except I really hope that mighty forces are on his side. <laughs> and my own boldness, which in my family of origin is called obstreperousness, and my husband, who's a psychiatrist, calls me oppositional defiant. <laughs> so, <sighs> but for the purposes of this talk, I'm sticking to bold. That started when I was told that um, chemical engineering was the most difficult degree at university. And I was also told that engineering was highly unsuitable for girls. So, of course, that made it totally irresistible. But I'm actually, even though I didn't have a complete clue about what chemical engineering was about, I really couldn't have made a better choice. And I believe that chemical engineers have got the skills to be able to contribute to solving all these pressing problems about water, energy, pollution, all the global problems of today. And we've, the chemical engineers of the world um, have got the ability to design processes, to improve processes. So I believe those skills are really what's needed right now. But back to eutectic freeze crystallization and being bold and mighty forces. When we started this project, it seemed like a totally crazy idea. And people said, good luck, and there was lots of skepticism. We borrowed a small refrigeration unit from a shipping company and in the laboratory, because the ice built up so quickly on the chilled surface, we damaged the crystallizer. Um, then we couldn't actually manage to get simultaneous crystallization of ice and salt out of the simplest copper sulfate solution. And when we got our own first crystallizer in the lab, um, the crystallizer was left overnight, no names mentioned, and the ice expanded and cracked the vessel and the coolant went all over the floor. So we had lots of excitement in the beginning, but we have made progress, little bit by little bit, layer by layer. And so my idea worth sharing is that the mighty forces that have come to our aid in this project are good science, good academic collaboration, good students, in fact, great students, and fantastic sponsorship from companies who believed in the work, sponsored the initial work, and now I've got excited to see where we've got to and are helping us to take the next step. So my view is that we have got to change our ways of thinking about water and waste. We've got to stop wasting water. We've got to stop thinking about contaminants as toxic and useless because they are the sources of new raw materials, and we've got to be bold because only then will mighty forces come to our aid.